It's not uncommon for a district attorney candidate to talk about keeping the streets safe, but it's not every day that a crime fighter talks about hope. That's one of the themes behind Vincent Gentile's run for Brooklyn district attorney. Mm -hmm. The New York City Council member who represents Bay Ridge to Bensonhurst is one of 68 candidates running to succeed the late Ken Thompson in the September 12th primary. Today, we welcome Vincent Gentile to our show. Thanks for joining us. Council. It's a pleasure to be here. Congratulations oh, on your Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm and still learning how to respond to that. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks. And thank you for moderating the uh, St. Francis it debate. It was a great time. Thank it was great. You. We had a good time. Yeah. Awesome. So, Council member, your opponents have a collective 100 years worth of experience in the DA's office. That's scary. That is a little <laughs> bit scary, but it's a lot, right? And you at this point don't have any experience within the DA's office. With the Brooklyn DA's office. Within the Brooklyn DA's office. So right. how do you enter this race with, with, with that kind of um, power in, within that office? Well, it, uh, I looked at the other candidates, and I looked at the kind of candidate that Ken Thompson was when he ran in 2013. And he was, he was someone who had legal experience but had no connection to the Brooklyn DA's office. Right. He came in as an independent, no connection to the DA's, to the prosecutors, to the cases, to the detectives, and he went in and he called it uh, without fear or favor. And during his short three years, he uncovered 21, 21, not one, two, or three, 21 wrongful convictions. And, and that, is, that is a serious problem in the Brooklyn DA's office. The worst thing you could say about a DA's office is that they're putting innocent people in jail. That's the worst thing, and that's the reputation Brooklyn has. Mm -hmm. So I looked at, at his experience, and I come from uh, into this race very much like Ken Thompson, as an outsider. I'm a lifelong Brooklynite, mm -hmm. but my uh, legal experience as a prosecutor was 11 years in the Queens, in Queens District Attorney's Office, and that's an office that has a great reputation for pro professionalism and, and a high standard of ethics. Mm -hmm. And I want to do, pick up where Ken Thompson left off. As the independent, mm -hmm. uh, everyone else came through the Brooklyn DA's office. I can go in, like Ken Thompson, as an outsider, and without fear or favor, continue to investigate those cases that should never have been resulted in, in conviction. In and there are about 100 more to look at. So Ken Thompson's <coughs> uh, work, as he saw, it, was cut short. You talked about those 23 convictions mm -hmm. that are overturned. So how do you intend to keep that momentum and even go past what he was doing? Uh, that's a good question. Certainly, I, I want to, when I get there, I want to uh, devote more resources to, to, the, uh, to the review unit um, uh, so, that, so that we can do these reviews more quickly yeah. and, and, and call the shots wherever they are, you know? There, there's a big question about Detective Scarzella right. and his role in, in, in these wrongful convictions. And, and as of now, the Brooklyn DA's office has sort of covered for Detective Scarzella by saying he did nothing wrong, they they protect themselves because if they admit that he did something wrong in these cases, the next question is what did the DA's office do that was complicit right. with Detective Scarzella? So I don't have that problem, right? right? I don't have that problem. I can go in and call the shots just like uh, Ken Thompson did. Even just yesterday, the Daily News uh, reported on on a uh, individual who is in prison for 27 years. Uh, Brooklyn, he was convicted for 27 years, and he's out in parole, and he's waiting now four years, four years for the Brooklyn DA's office to review his case. And he's charging that they're, they're dragging their feet right. because the, the prosecutor who convicted him is now a top executive in the Brooklyn DA, DA's office, and that Eric Gonzalez is covering for his top executive, and that's why they're, they're dragging their feet. See, that's what I'm talking mm -hmm. about. Eric Gonzalez and all the others have loyalties, connections to the prosecutors, to the cases, to the detectives, because they worked in Brooklyn. I didn't. Ken Thompson didn't. I didn't. So of the six, I, I am telling Brooklynites yeah. that I'm the best person to pick up the mantle where Ken Thompson left off. Of the six, it seems like each of you are trying to one-up each other, saying that you're the most progressive, I'm the most progressive, but you're the only one who is running as an independent or who says you're the independent candidate in the race. Why do you think this? 
Well, I, I, just because of the dynamics uh, of what it is, they, they can't they can't claim, and I say when I'm independent, I'm independent of the DA's office. Mm -hmm. I'm a lifelong Democrat, I'm a lifelong Brooklynite. So uh, I'm not saying I'm independent of that. Mm -hmm. I'm independent of what was going on in the Brooklyn DA's office during the, those years. So that's where my independence is. Uh, they can't claim that because they all grew up and, you, you know, uh, Eric Gonzalez tries to hang on to the coattails of, uh, uh, of Ken Thompson. Thompson. But if you look at it, he spent 19 years under Joe Hines, in management under Joe Hines, and only three years under Ken Thompson. Right. So, so the management style is a, is a Joe Hines, Charles Hines management style. And I've asked that question over and over again. What were the policies and procedures that were in place during those years that allowed these wrongful convictions to happen? Right. So on the theme of policies and procedures, because there's been a lot of criticism that this race is sort of bogged down in personality, just because there are so many people running. So looking at the office of Brooklyn DA and the CRU in particular, those uh, reviews, looking back at old convictions, do you think the DA's office should have a rear view mirror? There's lots of feelings and people get invested when we hear these stories of folks who are wrongfully convicted. But is it disproportionate to people who should be prosecuted now? Are we spending too much time mm. looking in the rearview mirror well, versus mm -hmm. prosecuting now? Let, let me say this. Uh, if someone is wrongfully prosecuted mm -hmm. and is wrongfully convicted, that's an injustice. Mm -hmm. And that injustice ha has to be corrected at whatever cost. Mm -hmm. has to be, but it shouldn't come at the expense of keeping people safe now. So we have to get the resources to do the job on both ends, to correct the injustices, but also to have the resources to keep people safe. Now, here's another difference uh, that I have with my opponents. Uh, none of them have negotiated budgets before. I have, as a legislator, legislator, for 14 years in the Council and six years in the Senate. So I know how to negotiate budgets. I know how to fight for a budget. And the DA's office has to go to the City Council every year and fight for a budget. I have spent 14 years in the city council. I have collegial relationships with everybody on the city council. That will serve me well when I go back as the district attorney to fight for a budget. We in Brooklyn have the largest caseload of any DA's office in the city, mm. including Manhattan. And yet Manhattan gets more resources, more money than the Brooklyn DA's office. And why is that? Because of the relationships that the Manhattan DA has with the, the stakeholders, the members of the council, the mayor, and so on. I have those relationships. I can do that for Brooklyn and, and increase our resources so we can do more to keep people safe, to give people hope, but also to correct the injustices of the wrongful convictions. So do you think we can money our way out of bad police work and internal problems at the DA's office? Is that a question no, of No, funding? I don't think it's resources. I, I, I think it's changing the culture. Gotcha. We have to change the culture. You have all the resources you want. If you don't have the right culture and the right professionalism, the right e ethics, it doesn't matter how much money you have, and it right? it takes a bigger budget or it, it doesn't? No, no, no. It, ta it takes a bigger budget mm -hmm. to have the types of resources you need to do if you want to have alternative treatment programs, if you want to have uh, um, outreach and, right. and, and across the borough. And I propose to do an outreach in every single one of the libraries, the 61 branches of the libraries, to have a DA's presence in every one of those libraries. So anybody within a half mile of their house mm -hmm. can go to the DA's office at, an, uh, at a public library. And I can do that because of the relationship I have with the Brooklyn Public Library over the years I've been on the city council. So it's, you need resources for those types of things. But, but uh, to change the culture, doesn't matter about the resources, you have to change the culture and you have to change the relationships there. And right now, I have to say to you that uh, the relationships at the Brooklyn DA's office uh, are not good because of the history. Uh, and, and the Brooklynites are gonna have to answer that question. Yeah. Do we now give this office back to someone who was in management during the time that these wrongful convictions were happening. Do we give it back to somebody like that? Or do we find someone who, like Ken Thompson, was independent enough to uh, call the shots the way they should be called? And you realize he, uh, Ken Thompson, before his death, uh, uncovered 21 wrongful convictions. Since his death, there have only been two wrongful convictions, and one of them was an election case, and, and that one was uh, pending.
Councilmember, at a recent candidates forum, three of your opponents promised to not prosecute low-level offenses, which are commonly referred to as broken windows offenses. But you and Acting DA Gonzalez both said you wouldn't commit to that. How come? Well, it, because there are, uh, there are a wide range of circumstances, uh, given the cases. Um, many, many times uh, it could involve a domestic violence situation where people are, are um, uh, in danger from their own family members. So you have to take it, on, anal analyze it on a case-to-case case case, case basis. But I agree, uh, and I think uh, one, of the, one of the other candidates said this, if we're not going to uh, end up asking for a jail sentence in the case, then we shouldn't be asking for bail mm -hmm. in those cases, right? Because if you're not going to end up in jail, uh, a jail sentence, they shouldn't ask for bail. Uh, and in more cases, we should be uh, at arraignments uh, seeking to get adjournments in contemplation of dismissal, which means the case goes on the shelf for six months. If the person uh, doesn't get into trouble again, after six months, the case is dismissed. You don't have to come back to court. You don't have a criminal record. It just gets dismissed automatically after six months. We should be doing more of that at arraignments so people are not going into the system. But I need to have that discretion and flexibility in those cases where you, you might have to pursue somebody if, in fact, they're a danger to the community or a danger to, uh, to their family. Council Member, we have a few seconds mm -hmm. left. Um, let's get back to this message of hope. Something that you tweeted out is, is give Brooklyn hope. And, and of course, we expect a DA to talk about safety, but maybe this message of hope is a little bit unexpected and reminds us a sure. little bit of Obama, even. <laughs> Can you tell us about this message? <laughs> That's mm -hmm. sure, sure, mm -hmm. absolutely. You know, uh, uh, the DA really, uh, first objective is to keep people safe, but you got to give people hope. And those, like you say, the low level, uh, 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 nonviolent uh, offenders who come into the system usually need some help, whether it be an addiction to alcohol or drugs or mental health, they need some help. So we have to give them that help to give them the hope that they don't come back into the system again, right? Mm -hmm. But I also want to do something else. I want to give youngsters hope for, the, for their own future so they don't come back, into, they don't get into the criminal justice system. And the way I want to do that is something that a DA has never done before. I want to use the 20 years I have as an elected official working with labor unions and businesses to create a dynamic where the DA brings them in to the picture and we find job opportunities for those areas of Brooklyn that have been overlooked and underserved. And, and I can justify that by saying the, DA, the DA's job uh, is to deter, deter crime, and the best way to deter crime is to make sure the youth have jobs. And that's one of the things I want to do. Well, he's the dean of the delegation. That's right. And the most senior guy in the city council, and now he wants to be your district attorney. Vincent Gentile, thank you for stopping by. We appreciate I appreciate it. this. Thank you so thank much you for the so opportunity. Much. Okay. We'll see you on primary day. Okay. That's right.